I'm, I'm really delighted to welcome Pedro Ferreira. Um, Pedro is a professor at the Heinz College and at the Department of Engineering and Public Policy at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, his research focuses on how people use technology and influence others to do so. Uh, most of his work focuses on the application of robust empirical methods to the analysis of large data sets obtained from the large-scale, network-centric, and randomized experiments. Uh, his contributions span three interrelated areas, the imp impact of ICTs on educational outcomes, social influence in large-scale data analytics, and the regulation of wholesale ICT markets. Um, he has a, a master's from MIT, a PhD in telecommunications policy from CMU, and he was a postdoctoral fellow at the UC Berkeley School of Information in 2004-05. Uh, he is also a professor of electrical and computer engineering, or has been, at the University of Lisbon. Join me in welcoming Pedro Ferreira. Thanks, Anu, for the introduction. Uh, and thank to you and to the iSchool for the opportunity of being here today and, and talking to you. And for all of you for squeezing in some time in your busy schedules to come to this talk. So I'm really grateful for, for the opportunity. Um, the work that I'm going to talk about today is about how social cues affect people's behavior. In particular, in this case, I'm going to look at the likability of products and how products, uh, the likability of products affects consumption. In this particular case, I'm going to be looking at the number of likes and how the number of likes affects the sales of movies in a video on demand platform. So this is a joint work with Miguel Mach, who is a PhD, was a PhD student that graduated with me uh, last month, and uh, other co-authors at the Heinz College, Roald Telang and Mike Smith. Before I delve into the details of this paper, let me just put it in the broader perspective to tell you that, uh, as Anu just mentioned, probably better than I can do, uh, my work is about how people use ICTs and how they influence others to use ICTs. Uh, most of my work is both structural and empirical in, in nature, and it's applied. Uh, I have a passionate for, uh, I'm passionate for education. I think it's, it's interesting, but it's also probably a duty that we look at how to use ICTs to better the quality of, of, of education to our younger generation. So I have done some work on the impact of ICTs on education. I have written papers on how um, the students' performance changes in schools, middle schools, when they get internet access. I've wrote on this same question at the university level, so when we have ubiquitous uh, wireless networks on the campus in a university, how does that change the mobility patterns of students and, and their performance, their GPAs? I've also um, wrote on how introducing broadband in schools affects the uptake of broadband in the households because the children like to use the internet in schools. They go home, they nag their parents, so this question of spillover effects. So I've been doing some work on, on uh, the impact of ICTs on education with uh, spin-offs for education policy. I also do work on large social networks and there I'm interested in understanding how peer influence plays a role on how people behave in social contexts and in social networks, how they influence each other. Uh, I have written uh, papers on how my friends affect my choice of wireless carrier, for example, uh, how they affect my choice of handset. If I see someone on a, with, a, with the latest iPhone, does that have a bearing on me going to buy an iPhone as well? Um, and the paper that I'm going to talk about today clearly fits this second area of research. Uh, I'm going to be looking how people through the number of likes influence other people to purchase movies. Um, I have a few slides in the end about other things that I do. If time permits, I would be happy to go, to go over them. So before getting into the details, let me give you a snapshot and a summary of what um, I'm going to share with you today. I'm going to talk about a randomized experiment that we ran for uh, most of the second half of last year in a very large telecom provider. Uh, if you go home and you're a subscriber of this cable provider, uh, you click on, on the TV and then you click on the video on demand uh, button on your remote control, and there's a number of movies that show up on the screen as suggestions. These numbers are tagged with the number of likes, how many people liked this movie in the past. 
and they're ordered from left to right in decreasing order of the number of likes. So the movie cover farther to the left has the highest number of likes. Okay. What we did in this experiment is that we randomly swapped movies. And I'm going to go in detail about how we did that. But for some times, some movies were displaced, were placed out of our order and with a fake number of likes, if you want. Okay. What did we find? We find that promoting a movie increases sales. Um, so things work according to our intuition to start with. But perhaps the most interesting result is that when you have two movies, and you promote a movie, this movie is going to sell less than the movie that was displaced. Okay? So it's like I have a very poor movie, I tell you, oh, this movie is great. In the end of the day, people don't buy this movie as much as the movie that was before in that slot. They don't even like it so much as the movie that was there before. So there, a movie, when a movie is promoted, it sells more, but not as much as the movie that was displaced. This means that manipulated movies, and companies might have incentives to manipulate movies, uh, manipulated movies tend to go back to their true slots if we allow the peer rating system to evolve over time. Um, and so, although the companies have an incentive to manipulate movies, uh, if consumers are allowed to express how much they like the content, the movies are uh, able to come back to their true slots and do their pre-treatment sales levels. Okay. Uh, again, uh, aligned with our intuition, movies that are more well-known are less sensitive to these manipulations. There's a, a, a really bad movie, if I tell you it's a very good movie, but everybody knows it's a bad movie, I'm not able to, to lie to you, so the, the people, uh, the, the outside information about the movies is, is a determinant on how uh, the manipulations work. And so, in a nutshell, we find that these self-fulfilling prophecies previously reported in the literature don't really necessarily apply across markets, especially in, in, in markets where the goods, goods are known and costly. There's a number of lab experiments where you recruit students and you see how they work, and I would be very cautious on how we extend those results to real-world settings. And my claim is that this experiment is an experiment in a much more real-world setting. Yes? Mm -hmm. What do you mean by sales? Sales, number of leases. So households can lease a movie on the video on demand system. You have your TV, you have a number of covers, you browse through covers, you can actually click a button and watch the trailer for that movie. And then you can purchase, you pay for that movie and you can watch the movie. So they actually purchase? They actually purchase and they actually pay the price for it. That's what makes this very different from lab experiments where there's no money involved. There's no f decision with the financial risk associated to it. I'll, I'll go into the details of everything that I have here, but the, the, this is the upshot of where I'm getting. So, I'd like to talk a little bit about the context and objectives for this experiment. I will detail exactly how we randomized throughout this experiment. We'll share with you the results and the discussion. Uh, I'll conclude and I have some ideas for further work and if time permits I will tell you a little bit about my research trajectory, how does this fit in my research portfolio, and I would like to, to go next. I mean, feel free to interrupt at any time, clarifying questions or deeper questions, the more the, the merrier. So, the context for this experiment is the following, is that um, home video became a dominant uh, part of, of, of sales in the, in the media industry. You can see here in this picture that as a percentage of GDP from the 70s up to 2010, theatrical revenues haven't really increased much. What has actually increased is other ways to purchase media, specifically TV, home video, and so on and so forth. And within home video, which is the largest increase here, video on demand is, is the, biggest, the biggest portion. Okay? I mean, I think you relate to these, to these ideas, think about Hulu, Netflix, or Amazon. They offer you 100,000 titles, whereas our typical brick and mortar store, our blockbuster around the corner would give us 3,000 titles. So there's plenty of more, more variety. Uh, economic theory uh, predicts that increased variety uh, may increase consumer welfare. We have more alternatives, we should be better off. That really depends on how you internalize the search costs. 
the more alternatives we have and the more variety there is, the more I have to search. Sometimes I'm tired of searching and I don't buy anything. And so this idea that more options lead to more welfare doesn't necessarily apply across, across the board. It really depends on how uh, you navigate the larger set of, of alternatives. And I would argue that what we really need is good recommender systems. Recommender systems that know everything about you and everything that you did and will able to point you very quickly to the next movie you want to watch. Um, this is no, no news. Think again about Hulu, Amazon or, or uh, Hulu, Amazon or Netflix. They do these recommender systems all the time, right? Um, however, it's extremely difficult to determine the true impact of uh, recommender systems or rating systems, it's a very difficult empirical question. Okay? There's a lot of observational studies that use historical data and try to tease out what is the effect of reviews either by people or critics or word of mouth on the sales and the success of movies. But depending on how or whether they actually uh, address a number of empirical concerns, endogeneity and observed effects, uh, they will, they will, uh, they will conclude, conclude differently. And here I have a number of, of studies that tell you that uh, reviews are very important and determine sales. Some others uh, actually find the completely the opposite. And uh, a little bit observational studies, to be honest, are all over the place. Um, some people have tried to run experiments to obtain identification of the true causal effect. Um, two, two studies that are most important are by Salganik in 2006, a paper in science that uh, looks at the popularity in a market of obscure songs. And Catherine Tucker from the Sloan School of Management and Zhang, uh, two years ago, looked at the popularity across wedding, wedding service vendors, a website that would provide services for, for weddings. In a nutshell, these two studies find uh, what's called the self-reinforcing effects. The more popular you become, the more you sell, the more you sell, the more popular you become, and so on and so forth. So there is this self-fulfilling prophecies in these studies. Let me spend some time uh, showing you how our study is different from the current literature and uh, we, we so claim a step ahead. We study the impact of likes on the sales of movies in, in video on demand. And I would claim that likes is a better measure of the experience that the user feels. And this is actually even more important for what's called experienced goods, Move, goods that you only really know if you like them after you purchase like movies. Um, in Salganik, Salganik's work in 2006, they look at downloads of songs. So they hired a number of students uh, and they allow these students to engage in a website in which you could download songs. Um, and this is a very noisy measure of preferences across songs. The reason is that people didn't actually have to pay for these, for these songs. Actually, the authors of the paper do acknowledge that some people downloaded songs they didn't like. How many songs do I have in my laptop that I actually don't like? And I don't download all the songs that I like. So it's actually a noisy measure, measure of performance. Um, in our setting, as I will detail in a little bit, the, songs, the, the, the goods, in this case it's not songs but it's movies, are not for free. In the well-known uh, uh, paper from Salganik and Watts in, in, in Science, um, they did an experiment in which the songs with the better quality were reverted to the back of the, of the list and they would eventually come up and the other way around. Uh, but that can actually be just an artifact that the songs, songs were free. I mean, if, you, if you're not paying for songs, you might just download the, the songs on the top of the list, but you might also download the songs in the, in the end of the list and all of a sudden these songs in the tail of the list get enough downloads that they can start climbing uh, back to, the, to, to their true spot. So they didn't look at songs that, uh, that people have had to pay for and they really had to, to engage. There was some financial risk to make these songs that were bad, these guys that as bad but that were good to climb back to the top of the list. Yeah? Can you have some evidence um, or measure of how familiar the subjects were with ordering the, the 
Uh, we have historical data on how much they use the system. Uh, and we run analysis for the people that uh, lease the most, for people that lease the least, and the results are pretty much the same across the board. Um, the other thing is that this, this paper by Solganik and Watts is about songs from uh, obscure bands. I think they tried to do it with this kind of song so that there was no bias, but in the end the results are only about unknown goods. Um, and so we are actually looking at movies that have been in a the movie theater before our experiment. So people really know about them, there's IMDb votes on these, on these movies and so on and so forth. So our study is, um, is a true real world setting in which you can actually go and search for information about the goods that you might want to purchase beyond the information in this closed platform, if you want. So it's not actually clear how the results of this study generalize to more real world settings. Uh, and uh, our contribution hopefully is about in unveiling how this can extend or not extend to real world settings where people really need to pay and really need to make decisions about what they're purchasing. They're just not downloading everything because it's for free. Uh, and hopefully these results that uh, the results that I'm going to show you are much more informative for how people actually behave. A word on, our, on the company that we have uh, worked with. Uh, this company is a large cable company, large telecom provider. It's listed in the stock exchange. It's the market leader of pay TV service in the country uh, where it uh, operates. And we're dealing with 1.5 million households. Okay. So that's where I say that I work with big data sets because it's really a lot of people leasing stuff over time. For each transaction, what do I mean by a transaction? You rented a movie. Uh, we have a timestamp. We have the identifier of the subscriber that leads the movie. In fact, we have the identifier of the set-top box because you can all have different set-top box in your house or in your uh, holiday place or something like that. So we actually have the MAC address of the set-top box. Uh, we have the ID of the asset that you leased. Drama movie, comedy movie, whatever it is. And then through that identifier, we can link to a number of movie characteristics. The price that you paid to lease the movie, uh, the title, the directive, studio, and so on and so forth. We have all these characteristics about movies. Um, we know the layout of the TV screen every time you purchase the movie. So I'll, I'll have some pictures to show you, but movies, as you might uh, anticipate, are organized into categories, drama, news, and so on and so forth. So we know how many clicks do you actually need it to go through to buy that purchase, to purchase that movie? So we can actually have a very good idea of search costs. Um, so we have this layout of the TV screen every time you log in. And there are two types of consumers. Uh, there are the standard consumers and the premium uh, consumers. Both of them can use video on demand. The biggest difference between these two consumers, these types of consumers, is that only the premium consumers have uh, uh, um, the number of likes on the screen and can issue likes, okay? So right here, you can understand that our experiment, which is about the number of likes and how the number of likes has an effect on consumption, on consumption uh, it's more geared towards the premium subscribers than the, the, the standard subscribers. In any case, I have results for s uh, premium subscribers, standard subscribers, and overall. Um, so this is a major, a major thing that we should keep in mind that this like information is only available to premium subscribers, which are about half of the people that use VOD in this, this company. Right, so the VOD interface is something like this. Uh, you can get access to movies through either the catalog or through what's called the highlight section. Okay? When you turn on the TV and you press the VOD button, you are given the highlight section, and under the highlight section, you'll have movies organized into drama, news, promotions, and so on and so forth. So you basically have about 10 different menus, and in each menu, you have at most 15 covers. That's what shows up on the TV. We can scroll up and down because not all of them fit on the TV screen. That's the highlight section. The highlight section has about 150 movies. 10 times 15, organized into different, different headlines. You can get out of the highlight section and go fetch for movies in the whole catalog. 
you can search with a string or you can go through all the tree and you can go to uh, movies, uh, children movies, comedy, adult movies and so on and so forth. And the catalog offers about 2,000 titles. Okay, so from the 2,000 titles, 150 are in the highlight section f and their search costs are actually much lower because they show up right away. This is a snapshot of the, the, the TV screen in actually the first day of our experiments, just to give you an idea. So here are menus. So these are all the new movies. These are all the suggested movies. The company has their own suggestions. And then you have here promotions and so on. You can scroll up and down. Okay. So you have the title of the menu. Under each menu, you have a bunch of movies from left to right. Uh, if the cursor is on the top of a cover, in this case, this one, Safe House, you have the title of the movie underneath, and if you are a premium subscriber, you have this information. 1,339 people liked this movie before. Okay? This, this is only available for, for the premium subscribers. <coughs> Each menu can hold up to 15 covers. The screen only shows up to 8. So you can scroll uh, left and right to get access to covers 9 to 15. Okay, so there's a little bit of a difference, difference in the search cost between the first eight covers under a menu and the other seven that are actually hidden. You can, ol you can only get to the other seven under each menu if you scroll right past the end of the screen. You scroll, can scroll up and down between, between menus. So let me just stop here and see if there's questions, if people understand how the interface works. No. It goes only up to 15. Uh, yes, but the first movie might have 1,000 likes, the second 100 likes. So I have uh, distributions to show you on the number of likes. But it's only 15 under each menu. Okay. All right, so what did we do with this? We played with it. Right? So we, we ran an experiment uh, in which the company was kind enough to agree with us to create a new menu for us. So they, s they, they start having 11 menus instead of, of 10. The new menu was ca called the most popular during the past few weeks. And what we did was the following. We looked at the number of likes that movies got in the past few weeks. We ordered them and we chose the 15 movies with the most number of likes in the last few weeks to introduce under this, under this new line. Okay? So there's a bunch of movies, they keep getting likes every day. We look at the last few weeks, we order movies according to the number of likes, we pick the first 15 and we plug into this line. Okay? The movies between 16 and 45, we keep them in a buffer. And I'll explain why we need these backup, uh, these backup movies. Okay? Uh, there's again a, different, a difference between the standard consumers and the premium consumers. Uh, the standard consumers, to go to this menu, they needed to click 10 times down. But the premium ones only need to click one, par one, 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 one time up. So we got a very good placement in the screen for the premium consumers, uh, but not so much for the standard consumers. How does this reflect in our analysis? We need to, take in to, we need to remember that a standard consumer to lease from our menu needs to already be somebody that is really willing to search to go 10 times down to get a movie. And they are more prone to bear search costs. That's, that's what we're talking about here. So the, this experiment ran for six months. This is an European country, and it started on July 3rd. July 2nd was the final of the Euro Cup, so they didn't want us to, <laughs> to mess up with the Euro Cup schedule, but the day after we started the experiment, it went for, uh, uh, over for six months, so s 24 weeks. <coughs> uh, and each month is split into four, into four weeks, and then weeks are named either true or false weeks. Okay. Yeah? Uh, these clicks up or down, do you mean uh, scrolling up and down? Scrolling up and down. What yeah. do you mean by click up? The page doesn't start at the top of the page? So you start here, one click up. If you're a premium consumer, you would go to our menu right away. Uh, but if you. It's already visible on the, on the screen, but your cursor is actually on, the, on this line. So these premium consumers, with one click up, they would go directly to our line. Uh, the other guys would need to go 10 down 
And the reason is because the menus for the standard consumers is not round robin. So they will need to go all the way down to get the last one. Okay. Any more questions? All right, so, um, so think about six months. In within each month, there's uh, four weeks. And every time a week comes, we call it a true week or a false week. How did we decide if it's a true week or a false week? We toss a coin. Randomness over there, right there. There's an exception. The first week in every month, it was always a true week to get the bearings right for people for the new movies every month. So the first week in every month is actually a true week. Every week after the first week is actually a, t a, cost, a, a, coin, um, I'm sorry, a coin toss. When we get in a true week, we do nothing. It's a true week. We provide true information to consumers. We list the first 15 movies with the most number of likes in the previous weeks from left to right, and we let it breathe. That's what we do in a, in a true week. In a false, false week, we do the following. We swap movies. Okay? So when we swap movies, the movie that has 20 likes goes to the second place, and the movie in the second place with 100 likes goes to the eighth place. So the movie that before had 20 likes all of a sudden gets 1,000 likes or 100 likes, whatever it is, and the movie there goes back to the 20 likes. So we swap two movies. Okay? Uh, we have two types of swaps. With what we call a within swap and a between swap. A within swap is a, a swap that changes the slots of two movies within the first 15. So inside our line. A between swap is a swap that gets a movie from the buffer, 16 to 45, into our line, and the movie from our line goes into the 16 to 45. The 16 to 45 don't show in the line because it only has 15. It shows in the catalog within the other 2,000 movies. So, so a within swap is a, a swap between two movies within our menu. The between swap is a swap between the highlight section and the full catalog. And the big difference between these two swaps is that this one will mostly capture the search costs. What's the value of being in the highlight section versus hidden uh, in the catalog? This will, talk, will let us know about how rank 2 or slot 2 is better than slot 3 or slot 4 within the first, the first 15. So pictorially, what we have is something like this. We have uh, our menu is 15 movies. The only first, the first eight are readily shown on the screen, but there's those se other seven that you can um, that you can scroll to the right. So a uh, within swap, we'll choose say mo movie one and movie eight, and we'll swap them, or movie one and movie 13, and we'll swap them. Okay, that's what a within swap is all about. Yes. Uh, I have a slide with that in a, in, in a second. Uh, I can tell you that the top 20% of the distribution buys a movie a month. 50% of the distribution f buys a movie every three months. So that's the, the order of magnitude. Okay? Uh, I'll have, and if I don't give you enough details when I get to the numbers, uh, ask me again, but, but I'll have descriptive statistics in a second. So a between swap is a swap that uh, gets a movie from the first 15 and, uh, and changes, uh, swaps the movie with uh, a movie in the buffer. Okay? From 16 to 45, that only shows in, in the catalog. So th this is what we did. Uh, we should note that weeks true and false are random, except the first week to get the bearings right. Uh, the movies that we, in a, in a false week, we, we do two or three swaps. And the movies that we swap were also chosen randomly. Okay, so there's, there's randomness in everything that we did here. What did we find? Uh, I'll start with some pictures uh, to show you naked eye what the results look like, and then I'll go through the, through the, the regressions. Um, the first slide I want to show you is a 30-day moving average of daily leases. So this kind of answers a little bit to your question about the size of, of, of the operation. So this is the beginning of the year, January 19th. This is the end of the year, uh, in the, uh, December. Uh, and this is 
you remember the highlight section has a number of uh, lines, right? And so here we have the sales for each line. Sometimes they have movies at discounted prices, and this is how many that, that, that line sells. Uh, they have the, their own suggestions. They have uh, a professional critic that they hired somewhere in the middle to, to provide them with suggestions. Um, they have the actor of the month, sometimes is uh, Tom Cruise anniversary, and so they put Tom Cruise movies in that line. Our experiment started there. Right, that's where it actually started. This is our, the sales in our menu. This line here. Okay. So we actually started selling very well, as consumers were aware. And then sales start decreasing. I mean, they actually start decreasing everywhere. This is a country in an economic crisis. Okay. <laughs> and it actually sells a little bit less when the company was so happy with our menu that they created other menus similar to ours. Our menu was the most popular movies. They got the idea, let's do the best sellers, the ones that sell the most. Our menu is the ones that are liked the most. They created a movie with the ones that sell the most, and that gets a little bit from our menu. Okay, but uh, they were happy overall. Um, so this is where they actually introduced the additional menus. The problem with the introducing additional menus, in the first place they actually didn't tell us, so we couldn't control for it, but it was just a few days. Uh, the problem with this is that um, when a movie was at the same time a bestseller and the most liked, it would go to the bestseller, not to ours. Okay, so we lost a few observations over there. Was that a question? It, uh, it's the same person with very exquisite taste, I would say. Uh, and I, 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 I asked a lot why there was this jump, and then it jumps back again a little bit. Yeah. Um, I was told that he basically here suggested Christmas-like movies that everybody watches anyways. Uh, and so that's, that's what was happening there. Um, we were very happy at some point that we randomize and sell more than this guy that knows about movies, right? So, so we were happy at this point. At this point, we were very happy. This is um, just for our experiment, since our experiment started until the end of the, of the year. The number of uh, leases uh, per week, you can see that the premium consumers lease more than the standard consumers, okay? Uh, and this might be, again, because the standard consumers need to click 10 times down to go to our line, so we're just getting at, to, uh, at that, that the, this line is more used by the, the premium consumers than the standard consumers. This is the leases per week in our menu. Okay? So the movie ranked number one is the farthest to the left in our line, and so on and so forth, and everybody in the catalog was ranked 16th. Okay, so there's only 15 movies in our catalog, in our line, ranked from 1 to 15. The movies in the catalog are ranked 16. And here you can see the sales per slot. And the most interesting thing for me from this picture is this is not linear, or that it's not monotonic. Okay. So you see that the movie farthest to the left sells more, but then apparently on average movie in the fourth position sells more than 2 and 3. There's variance here to talk about. That's the point that I want to make. This is not a monotonic, uh, a monotonic uh, uh, function of, of rank. Uh, people don't necessarily rank always the first. They can rank the fourth or the fifth movie. Eight of them show in the screen, so the search cost between the second and the third and the fourth are not really that big. You do need to click to get there, but, but they're all on the, on the screen. This is the number of likes per week that you get as a function of rank. And here I think we see at least a somewhat of a different story because the first eight movies, the ones that are shown on the screen, get many more likes than the ones that are in the hidden part of the screen. So it looks like uh, if you are within the first 15 movies but you're hidden in the scroll part, people don't like you so much. Or at least they don't issue enough likes. But they do get some leases. I think it's just really a matter of, of quality of those, those, those movies. This is a plot of the change in the number of leases, sales if you want, 
as a function of our rank manipulation. So how do we compute the rank manipulation? Well, if you are movie number one and you're demoted to position number 10, your rank manipulation is minus nine. Okay, so it's coded that if you're demoted is a negative number and the size of the manipulation is just the difference between where you were and where you're gonna go, okay? So negative rank manipulations are movies that were demoted, that we randomly demoted. Movies that are positive rank manipulation were promoted, okay? Control movies, we didn't change them, right? They remain in the same, in the same slot. This uh, naked eye shows clearly that a movie that is going to be promoted will sell more. This is what these regression, these trend lines show. Okay? So when you, when you swap movies either within or between, uh, b within or between, uh, you sell more if you're promoted, you sell less if you're demoted. Okay? If you actually come from the catalog to the highlight section, the difference is way bigger than within the line. Okay, this is the green. The green is a, is a movie that comes from, the, it's buried in the 2000 in the catalog and comes to the 15 on the screen. It sells way more. If you come from 10 or 9 or 8 to the first or second, you also sell more. There's also always a counterpart to this story because when you promote a movie, you got to demote one, right? And so the, the movies that are demoted sell less. This is just a correlation, of course, but uh, points in the direction that I, I want to claim. <laughs> All right? This is, again, the, the rank. Movies 1 to 15 are in our line. 16 is the movies in the catalog. This is, again, the rank, or the slot on the screen. And this is the average lease, number of leases per movie per week. A different way to look at the same data. And the point that I would like to make here is that looks like that demoted movies uh, sell more then the movies they displace, the control movies, okay? So imagine that you are a movie, say, at rank 10. If you were not demoted or promoted to that movie, you were a control movie at that rank. So at, the, at rank 10, the control movie sells less than the demoted movie. So I demote you, you're better quality, you're going to displace a guy in the end of the, of the tail, but you're better quality, you sell more when you're demoted. So I bring Lion King from position 2 to position 10, and Lion King is a good movie, so I think. It displaces somebody, another movie at number 10, it's going to sell more than the movie that was displaced. So the demoted movies sell more than the movies they displace. Uh, we get the opposite result for promoted movies. Uh, there's a very uh, bad movie that I promote to position number 2. Will it sell more or less than the movie that was before in position number 2? Less. Control number two, right? The control movie was going to sell 150. Every time there's a control movie in rank two, it sells 150 on average. If it's a movie that I promoted, it sells 75. Okay? So this is pictorial evidence that I can fool you, but not that much. That's what I'm, I'm talking about. If I promote a movie, it's going to sell less than the movie that I displace. If I demote a movie, you can still find that it's a good movie, although it's to the tail of the, of the, of the screen. Questions? No? All right, so this is some discrete statistics. I'm not going to go into detail. The only point I want to make is that because we choose moves, movies randomly, the descriptive statistics of our controlled uh, movies and our treatment movies are not different. Okay, we pick them randomly. So take a look at the number of leases. Well, the number of leases for the movies in the highlight section in con that are controlled is 80 for the treaty is 82. There's no differences we could expect, uh, we could, uh, couldn't expect otherwise. There's no differences in most of the important covariates, even, even in the price. The movies that, I con that, are, that are in the control group that I don't change don't have a price different from the movies that I changed. Uh, they were randomly chosen. So there's, there, this is just a t-test shows us that all these things are, are similar. IMDB rating, for example. The movies that were controlling that I didn't touch have the same quality as the movies I touched. They were randomly selected. So our first hypothesis that we would like to test is that a promoted movie sells more. 
I don't think this is the rocket science part, but it's just to make sure that our intuition is corrected. When you promote a movie, it's going to sell more than what it used to, to sell when it, w it was to the tail of the, of the screen. So to test this hypothesis, we ran uh, a, a fixed effects regression where we try to explain the leases of movie I in week T as a function of whether the movie was treated uh, and then some movie <laughs> characteristics, in this case the age of the movie. It's important to control for the age of the movie because sales reduce dramatically. Movies age very quickly, that's something I learned with this experiment. We also, another thing that explains how much a movie sells is how many menus the movie shows. Uh, I also learned that movies can be drama, comedy and romance at the same time. Okay, so the number of places where you show in the interface should have a bearing on how much you sell. So we control for how many times in the catalog you actually show up. Okay. Then we control for something called rank true. What is rank true? It's the slot on the TV you would have been shown if we didn't change your slot exogenously. Okay. So if you are a control movie, you show in this position. Okay. The important part is this one, right? It's uh, whether you were treated within the line and how much. So rank manipulation is the size of the manipulation. If you go from 1 to 10 is minus 9. Uh, and treated within is just a dummy, 0 or 1, whether it's a, a treatment within the line or whether you came from the catalog to our line or whether you were demoted from the line back to the catalog. So these two will capture uh, pretty much the search costs be between uh, the catalog and the uh, highlight section. And this variable here will capture uh, how much a slot within the line makes a difference. Okay. This is the fixed effect. I want to point th this out. We're, con bec we're controlling for everything that we don't observe but that doesn't change over time. Okay. All the movie characteristics that you can think about that I don't know. And we uh, add weak, weak dummies. This allows us to control the for the fact that the third week in the month might always be different from the fourth or the second because people get their pay on the third week of the month in this country or something like that. So we're controlling for specific, thing, specific factors that are related to time, not to the movies, but relate to, to, to all movies that, uh, in the same way. This table shows us our results. The first column is results for the aggregate of consumers, standard and premium all together. The second uh, column is just for the standard consumers, the guys that added to click 10 times down. And the third column is the premium consumers, the ones for whom this, exper uh, this experiment was mostly uh, designed for. And the first result I want to point out is that whether you were treated or not doesn't have an impact on your sales. That makes perfect sense because, again, movies were randomly chosen. Just because you were chosen, you don't sell more. You sell more because we might have promoted you. But we didn't, because we choose moves, movies randomly, whether you're treated or not shouldn't make a difference. Okay? And this is our first check. Okay? Well, this is our main result. If you are promoted one slot within the line, your sales increase by 2.8. This is on average 4%. Okay? And the result is highly statistically significant for the premium consumers, less so but still at 10% for the standard consumers. So in fact when you come from number 10 or number 8 or number 5 to number 1 or number 2, you sell more. On average, across all manipulations we did throughout these 6 months, per slot you increase 4%. Uh, I haven't tried uh, any non-linear regression here because m promoting from number 2 to 1 might be different from promoting from 10 to, il from 10 to 9, but you get the picture. I mean, I, I, can, I can do that pretty easily. This is the other set of results that is interesting is that when you come from uh, the catalog, you're buried within the other 2,000 movies, but you come to the highlight section, on average you sell way more, seven times more what you used to sell, and why they demote you from the highlight section back to the catalog, you sell three times less what you used to sell before. Okay, so this is mostly capturing the effect of search costs. If you're on the screen, you're good. If you're buried in the catalog, you're pretty much dead. That's what this shows. 
The second hypothesis, which I think is the most interesting part of this paper, is not comparing what you sell with what you use to sell, but comparing what you sell with the guy that you're displacing used to sell. Okay? And so the hypothesis is that the promoted movie to a fake rank sells less than the true movie at that rank. Okay? So how do we uh, test that hypothesis? We do a rank level fixed effects regression in this case because I am concerned with each rank and not with each movie because different movies land in different ranks over time. I want to explain the sales of rank R in week T as a function of the characteristics of the movie that are at rank R in week T. And those are the movie age, the number of menus where the movie shows, the price of the movie, the IMDB rating of the movie. And these are again the, the variables that are interesting for us now. Promoted means that you were promoted to a rank. Demoted means that you were demoted to a rank all within the line. These ones capture the fact that you were promoted to a rank but you came from the catalog. And this one captures that you were demoted from a specific rank back to the catalog. And then again we have all the weak dummies, rank dummies, genre dummies, in the release dummies. So we can control for everything that, uh, that, that, that we can. What are the results? Again, three columns. The first one is for all consumers together. The second one is for the standard consumers and the third one is for the premium consumers. What we show here is that if you are promoted, say from slot 9 to slot 2, you sell less than the guy that was there before. So it's a negative result. So uh, think about a very bad movie. It was in slot 10. It used to sell 20. Now I'm going to get this movie and switch it to slot 2. It's going to sell more than 20 because it is promoted. That's the first uh, result. But less than the movie that was here before. Okay. Uh, this result is, is significant uh, at a 10% level. The, the, the result in a different direction uh, uh, takes place for demoted movies. So when I demote a movie, a very good movie, I put it in the tail of the screen. It sells more than the guy that was there before. Um, yeah, is there a question? The result reminds me of uh, some of the uh, problems that people have, for example, with uh, uh, the belief in Yelp or the belief in likes. And, 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 and so, I, I, um, as you said earlier, they have other evidence about how good that movie is from being alive and being in the environment and the movies that were in the films. And so, for many of the subjects, I would assume that the, the false promotion is transparent, mm -hmm. but it also one wonders about the believability of the authority from your sponsor of the likes that are shown, because what they're trying to do at the end of the day is sell movies. Yes. So. So therefore, the consumer doesn't believe them. We we believe the collaborative behavior. Okay. But to the extent that the collaborative behavior becomes suspect. Uh, we'd rather talk to uh, the guys sitting next to us on the bus. I think. Yeah, so, so that's a very good point. Um, what can I tell you about that? I can tell you a few things. Um, I, can sh I, I have some backup slides that show that the consumers that were dubbed didn't change their behavior after they were dubbed. So I can actually show you that if you bought a promoted movie that was a fake promoted movie, you're not going to lose less because of that. You probably issue fewer likes because you didn't like that movie so much, but the consumers didn't change their behavior. And we do that with propensity score matching to, to take care of heterogeneity in the consumers. Um, we, we, we do that. So we believe that the consumers not only knew they were part of an experiment, but they really, they really didn't understand that and they didn't change their behavior. The, f the company, as, a, as you can see here, the company has an incentive to manipulate movies. But that depends on the contract with each movie provider. Uh, if I have two movie providers and I am this company, I want to promote yours if I have a better margin on your movie than on his movie. Because I'm going to get money if I promote yours, but I'm going to lose money on his movie. Right? And so overall, 
the effect might not actually be positive. It might be positive in one specific contract, but not com positive on the overall. We have weak evidence that the company made money with these manipulations. Uh, and the consumers liked the movies less, but they rented the same number of movies after they being dubbed anyways. So I would like to tell you more about welfare implications, but I don't want to claim more than I can. Okay, and I have some slides on the, those regards. So we did some welfare analysis. We looked at whether consumers change their behavior after they're being dubbed because that would contaminate our, our findings. Now, uh, this is about number of leases, right? So what I want to show next is what is the effect of the number of likes? So if I promote a bad movie, will you get more likes or fewer likes than the movie you displaced. And what we see here is that if you are promoted, you get fewer likes. People don't like you so much. If you are demoted, you get more likes. So if I get a very good movie, I don't demote you to the end of the screen. Not only sell more than the guy that was there before, but people also like you more than the guy that was there before. And the, the opposite to the promoted movie. So if I take these two results together, what this shows is that if you manipulate movies, and you let the system breathe, it, they will eventually come back to the true slots. So peer rating systems in a, in, in, in a real world environment seem to work and correct for exogenous strategic manipulations by the firm. That's what we're showing here. I can show you this pictorially. So let me show you what this, this picture looks like. Uh, this is the number of leases per week for demoted movies and promoted movies. Okay. So the demoted movies were demoted here at time zero, and this is what they used to sell before they were demoted. Okay? Uh, the same for promoted movies. So what we see here is that three weeks, two weeks, one week before you were demoted, this is what demoted movies used to sell. Kind of somewhat a, 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 an horizontal line. When you were demoted, you sell way less. That's what we saw. But you recover back. Uh, for promoted movies, a similar result. Before you're promoted, you, you're selling at this level. Here you can see actually the aging of the movie. The week you're promoted, you sell way better. But it comes back to what you used to sell before. So we find this evidence that the movies that we exogenously, randomly manipulate come back to the true slots, to the true levels of sales. If we let the consumers express their uh, how much they liked the, the movies. Um, so this is the treatment. This is what demoted movies, demoted movies will sell less, promoted movies will sell more, but they come back to the, truth, to, the true, to the true levels. Here, this is the same picture as I showed you before. This is the same picture I showed you before. This is actually what happens to the control movies, the ones that were not demoted or promoted. And what you see here for the control movies, there's no jump because I didn't change them. They're just aging over time. And in fact, if I blend all these three pictures together, this is the promoted movies. They jump and they come back. This is the demoted movies. They jump and they come back. And this is the control movies. And so what I'm trying to do here is, if I didn't promote these movies or I didn't demote these movies, and I, think, and I thought that the trend was just the same as control movies, they would have ended up here. And as you can see, this kind of counterfactual analysis, they all come back to the true, to the true sales they would have had, had I not manipulated them. Okay. All right, so um, any questions? Like, was yes. it one, two, yeah. and so you could see yeah. this had less likes. Yes. The likes was not fabricated, the number of likes. The, the, the likes was not fabricated. What we did is what we swapped movies. Just the movies. So the, the number movies. The number of likes wasn't, fabricated. the way we fabricated the number of likes is because we swapped the movies. So we were attached to a different number of likes, but the number of likes is not fabricated. And then as people issue likes throughout the week, you can see it on the screen. So that could just, that could just mean that people are looking at the actual numeric value as opposed to the ordering on the screen. That's a very good point. Um, I don't have, I do, uh, but uh, it's very hard to disentangle the effect of the slot versus the effect of the number of likes. Right? How visible is the number? It's very visible. Yeah. But what we did, 
uh, and I can tell the result is significant at a 10% level, the way we, th we would think is that, um, so let me rephrase your question. The, the question might be, is it the number of likes or is it the rank, the order in which you're shown? How, the way we answer that question is conditional on rank how does the number of likes actually, actually change sales? Because sometimes the movie in slot number two has 100 likes, sometimes has 1,000 likes. So can that conditional on rank, so I'm not changing you to number one or number three, so on number two, do you sell more when the number two has more likes versus fewer likes? And we see a, a mild positive result um, in trying to disentangle the number of likes from the, from, from the rank. Okay? Um, ideally, I would like to have shown different number of likes to different people. That's the, all yeah, that's the way I, I, I would design, ideally design this experiment. The bad news is that I couldn't because the platform of this company wouldn't allow me to show different number of likes to different people, but now it does. And so I'm running an experiment in which I can actually tell you, roughly speaking, that a like is worth a cent. Sorry? At this. Sorry? Can you repeat that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I am... the the. One of the limitation of this study is that everybody sees the same number of likes in the movies. If I wanted to understand how likes are valuable, I would need to randomize and some people I show a different number of likes than other people. The company didn't allow us to do that, more because of technical questions. They all have um, the same platform that shows the same number of likes to everybody. Uh, and so I, can, I, I couldn't do that at the time. Now we're able to do that. And actually I learned that th the way the cable company does that is that it builds parallel catalogs with different number of likes and through frequency division multiplexing sends different likes, s sends the same, the same catalogs to everybody but through IP it captures the right frequency. So there's some technology involved on this. So now I have looked at how much a like is valuable and roughly speaking is a kind of cent. So if you have one more like, uh, the revenue of the company for that movie increases in a s one cent. The, all the movies in the line are ranked by likes. By likes. By likes. Yes. When you say where the cent, you mean to the cable company that distributes? Revenue. Okay. Revenue. Yeah. The revenue in general. Uh, revenue, not profit. Revenue. Yeah. So it's the, number of, it's the increase in the number of sales because you were promoted times how much the movies are, uh, are priced. So I mean, just contrasting to, this, to the work by Salganic and others, you know, I mean, Salganic shows that there's this kind of bandwagon effect. Mm -hmm. You haven't strictly shown that that doesn't exist, right? Because mm -hmm. that, that effect could be attributable to the numeric values as opposed to the values that just the rank ordering and physical placement, right? Yes, so uh, there's there, so the rank and the number of likes are correlated. So think about the concept of likability, whether it's the number of likes or it's the order in which you're shown on the screen. What we are showing is that when people have to pay for these things, these self-fulfilling prophecies that Salganik and what's shown don't seem to, to, to occur. Because the f movies that are demoted come back to the true slots and the movies that are promoted come back to the, the, to the true slots. In their case, uh, if you start getting downloads, even if you're not good enough, I mean, you become the most popular one. And if you don't get downloads, you're in the tail of the, of the distribution. So this, it's interesting because these results I'm claiming are different. And the, the, the biggest difference is the context. The movies are known, there's outside information about them, and they, they, they need to involve financial um, decisions, right? Interestingly enough, last month on Science, Sina Naral uh, uh, from the Sloan School of Management published a paper that it's in between ours and what's uh, in 2008. He has shown that um, the demoted movies, it's not movies in this case, it's just a review, again, there's no payments there, but um, uh, what transporting his results to our context, it shows that the demoted movies uh, uh, don't come back to the true slots and the promoted movies do. So it's like in between. He hasn't yet gone all the way, but also he doesn't yet work in the real world with, with, with prices, with real uh, things that cost money. Just very briefly, uh, the role of outside information. Uh, what I have been claiming is that um, if movies are better known outside this platform, uh, people would be less sensitive to, to the manipulations because I cannot 
manipulate. I can manipulate these movies, but I'm not, not going to be able to, to fool you that much. And so what we use as a measure of how known movies are, it's basically your votes on IMDb. Votes is not if you're good or bad, it's how many people voted. So how, how, how well known uh, you are, and um, there's a, a superstar effect, a relationship between votes and ratings, but I'm not, take, I'm not using ratings. I'm using how well known you are. I'm using IMDb votes until December 2012 to control for how well known you are to the outside community. And as you can see here, there's lots of variation in the ratings. I'm not uh, just working with um, bad movies or good movies. And so what I show here is that if I interact my rank manipulation with whether or not you're in the top quartile of the IMDb number of votes, uh, this makes a big difference. If you're more well known, if you're in the top quartile of the IMDb votes, the rank, the effect of my exogenous rank manipulation is lower. Right? This is the, the effect we have seen before, but if you're in the top 20% of the IMDb votes, you need to take this into account as well. So this shows that uh, movies that are better known outside the system uh, are less prone to these, to these manipulations. Right, so uh, conclusion. I've shown you this slide before, but now you have all the information. We have run an experiment using the video on demand system of a large telecom provider. Um, we looked at the effect of rules on the consumption of movies. The movies were shown from left to right in increasing order of the number of likes. And at random points in time, we picked up random movies, we swapped them, so we lied about the number of likes. And what happened was that on average, promoting a, slot by, uh, a movie by one slot increases sales, but not as much as the movie you displace. And so the peer rating systems, in my opinion, in the real world, have this ability of uh, making things go back to the true slots. Uh, this, on the other end, gives the company an incentive to keep manipulating different movies, right? Because if you manipulate a movie, but it goes back to the troop slot, the company is going to manipulate another movie next week. So that's what, in the end of the day, is actually happening with this company after we run, <laughs> after we run the, the experiment. They don't, they don't lie about the number of likes, but they cherry pick the movies they show, right? Because the way to actually uh, manipulate the information you provide to consumers without lying about the number of likes is hiding some movies on the catalog and showing some movies on the highlight section. So what's the difference between the amount, the deals that they have with the producers? I mean, is there a large financial difference between the different uh, I, have, I have some average data. They didn't release the data on the movie level, but I can tell you that the margins... Uh, there's a variation of about 50% in the margins. So... Um, the, the, the two ladies that used to pick the movies have a harder time now because their boss knows that this is going to make a difference in the end of the day. They're very uh, happy because in the end of the day, after we've shown all of this, we created a simple Excel file in which they can, sh they can know which movies to pick, which is extremely easy to, to do, and they're, they're happy with it. Um, so movies tend to go back to their true slot. This is the most interesting finding that I believe I can share with you. And I have presented this talk in, in, in other places and I've been thinking about it. And so there's a bunch of ideas for further work. Uh, I'm not going to go through detail, in detail through this unless you want to, to ask questions. I, I have the whole evening. <laughs> but um, the, the, the concerns with this paper are basically of two kinds. One is... I've talked to you about control movies and, and, and uh, uh, treated movies. And the question is whether there's a relationship between the two. Because if I treat movies but somehow I also contaminate the control movies, I lose my stable reference of comparison. And we have done some work that shows that actually the cross elasticities of sales between control and treated movies are close to zero. So the fact that your movie number three and you're close to number two and number two are treated, doesn't apparently change the sales of number three. It changes its own sales, but not the sales close to you. The other kinds of um, analysis that I've done, we discussed a little bit, is uh, what are the welfare man implications of manipulations. The company has, we have weak evidence that the company makes money with it. Uh, the consumers 
didn't change their behavior after they leased the movie that we exogenously manipulated. So indeed, I have results for all these um, these uh, these um, these things. If you want to talk about them, yep. I just wonder if some of the uh, premium subscribers uh, uh, happen to be uh, more active tweeters, and 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 the impact of social networks, and, and whether you had a chance to look at any of that in terms of the sentiment associated with a particular title or a particular actor. Uh, that's in the making right now. Um, in fact, we are partnering with, uh, with uh, researchers in this country that uh, have access to the tweet feed for this country, and they're looking for the titles of the, of the, of the movies. Because one of the, the, actually, I spent some time talking to the head of CRM at this company, and apparently one of the biggest questions right now is how much is a tweet worth? <laughs> and if I can actually manipulate the number of tweets, and I can do that because I can... In Next week I'm going to show you 15 movies, I'm going to inject some tweets in this country. Um, randomly, if I can do that randomly, I can definitely tell you how much a tweet is worth, and what's the substitutability between a tweet and a like in this platform. Which one is worth the best? Uh, but at this point we didn't we didn't do that. Um, what would be the implication? The implication would be, I'm not sure if there is a problem because we choose movies randomly. That's the beauty of a randomized experiment. Right? The movies that I'm promoting that I am demotic are not related to whether they get tweets or didn't get tweets. They're only related to my, my uh, co uh, uh, cost of the time. Oh, I'm sorry, toss of the coin. So, uh, that's my defense throughout <laughs> most of the questions, is that this is really a randomized experiment. I'm going to say thank you. Let's give a big Other questions? If you, if you ask me a question, I want to ask if you use the microphone. Just a very quick question to something that you said early on, and in fairness, in passing and moved on, but you describe movies as experience goods. And in one way, does your whole experiment in some ways say that that's a pretty dodgy ca category to use? Because in some sense, all these ratings are undermining this simple binary distinction between search and experience goods. You don't necessarily have to taste the movie to know if it's any good for you if you're relying on tweets and rankings and the like. And lest the question, does this ask anything about your study, and does it ask something about that Nelson simple binary categorization? Um, so, I need to acknowledge that you can issue a like even if you didn't watch the movie. We can, the people can do that. Um, we don't know if you actually watch the movie until the end. Do you get more utility from watching only half the movie and then get asleep or watch the whole movie? I don't, I don't know. What I can tell you is that people don't lose less because, because they're that. I think it's um, the, the important thing. I mean, these are experienced goods, and so I, I, I would tend to think that somebody, if somebody issues a like, they really like the movie. Uh, so if anything else, we might be uh, doing some downward bias because some people just don't care. Uh, by issuing likes, and one of the questions that I have for myself that I still need to think about is if there is some confounding effect between just some consumers just don't issue likes. Uh, but then again, the movies I choose was, were random, so it would be just really bad luck. Um, so so I, I, I don't necessarily claim that the, that the fact that the goods are experienced goods uh, make, makes a big difference. Uh, the analysis that I'm doing right now is what happened to trailer, movie trailer views. Because before you actually buy a movie, you can watch the trailer. And so I'm trying to run uh, analysis of whether promoted movies get more trailer views, but then you see, oh, this movie was, was not that great. So uh, does the rate of conversion from trailers to leases actually changes? depending on whether the movie was promoted and demoted. And I think that is going to t tell us a little bit more about the chain to actually purchase these, these goods, because you can actually experience a little bit um, how good the movie is before you actually commit to buy the movie. Uh, is the trailer actually a good proxy for how good the movie is? 
I don't know. It's just the best moments of the movie anyway, so I'm doing that analysis, but I'm not going to claim that I actually know everything about how people choose experienced goods in this paper. I, I cannot do that. Possibility of, with regard to trailers, the possibility of um, of getting getting more engagement and an interactive process has has been explored. Uh, recently, there was a movie called Side Effects, and uh, one of the ways in which Side Effects was promoted was when you clicked on Side Effects, you actually saw the star whose name I forget, but some some important star who behaved as a therapist and asked you questions, uh, uh, which, which referred to the things that, any, anybody else see that besides me? No, okay. And, but, you know, but I think that that kind of engagement is going to, uh, trailers are very important, clearly. Yes, yes. This is a different kind of a trailer, but it was very, I thought it was very effective. Yes. It is very important, and in this company, 18% um, of trailer views convert into sales. So it's, it's a big screening mechanism. 18%? One out of five converts into a sale. So it's a big screening. Um, my concern here, and we tried to do a little bit of that, was to look at movies that have trailers and movies that don't have trailers, to see if we could have like some control and treatment and could take a difference. But movies that, that don't have trailers, guess what? They're different from the other ones. So we couldn't actually compare meaningfully movies that have trailers that don't have trailers. I'm not able to convince the company to erase the trailers for a number of movies. So there's not much. So, so I'm reluctant in, in adding uh, analysis on trailers to this paper because it can actually be criticized in many different ways. Yeah. Uh, so thanks for uh, thanks for uh, an interesting talk. Um, so I'm, I'm just following up on the question of kind of uh, likes versus uh, a physical uh, placement. So you know, more generally, I'm kind of curious about whether or not you think uh, kind of user interface questions like that could play a role in the effects that you've observed. You know, in general, when I looked at your talk, you kind of took the user interface as a given in terms of how the uh, company presents its information. But if you were able to manipulate the user interface, uh, a, do you think it would have an effect? And B, what would, what would be some of the manipulations you try? Uh, absolutely. Um, a number of ideas come to mind. When we manipulate the user interface, I don't want that to confound anything else. So I think actually it is a good thing that we didn't touch the user interface and everything I can be attributed to the fact that I switched the movies on the same interface. If I were to switch movies but give you a better interface than the other guy, then how could I split the effect? Um, we are trying to do something with this company, which is not to change the interface, but it's to send alert messages to some, uh, through SMS to these people. Look at the new movies under the new menu they created for us and see if that, that's not a change in the interface, but it's calling up the attention for this line. That's what we are trying to do on, uh, in a random fashion as well. I certainly believe that changing the interface makes a big difference. The bad thing with working with a cable company is that it's not HTML. Right? You cannot just place a new color on the line or whatever that quickly because this is, this is a cable company and the, the way the, the, the interface is set up, uh, it's not flexible enough. So we're trying to use another channel to, to create more attention to one line. But it would be quite interesting to change not the number of likes but the, the, the user interface, and you guys know here know much more than I do about how user interface could play a role. If we could do it with a randomized experiment, we could really know okay, what, yeah. what interface is better. Now, you know, I, was, I didn't realize it wasn't HTML this whole time. So I was wondering what exactly. you clicks and all. Don't they have a mouse? You know? <laughs> uh, and, and I didn't realize uh, three months into the experiment because at some point I wanted to do something <laughs> like you go, you create an app and you can very easily put a different interface to different people in here. No, I mean, this is a frequency division multiplexing. We have the same catalog to everybody. If we want to actually change the number of likes, we need to use different frequencies. And that's not going to happen with a cable company. So it's not going to happen. Okay, thank you. Should I just uh, tell you a little bit, two minutes, about everything else that I'm doing? So a couple of minutes. Uh, my research is, uh, I would say, applied network science. I, am a, uh, I do mostly of applied work, 
but I also long for uh, generalizable research. And the underlying question that combines all the fields that I've been working on is how do you actually run these randomized experiments in network settings? And the concern is that everybody is connected to everybody else. Treatments in fact control. You can try and limit the contamination, but I think the more interesting question is actually there is contamination. Let's assume there is contamination. And what are the principles to design randomized experiments in network settings that correct for potential contamination? And so you can tease out these, these causal effects. There's a, a, a number of people that have been claiming that we should go from causation back to correlation. We always try to go from correlation to causation because correlation is about the what, causation is about the why, it's the actionable knowledge. People have, some people have been claiming we have so much data that we only need to do correlations and figure out what's going on. Uh, I don't agree. Uh, that's, that's my stake, I don't agree. I think the fact that we live in a big data era and there's more and more data, there's actually more potential for wrongdoing because you get all these significant spurious correlations and what they exactly mean, I think, might be, might be a problem. So. I do structural models to capture the micro-mechanisms of how people work, although I've just shown you here reduced form equations, I, did, I wouldn't have time to show you the structural model of how consumers beha behave. Uh, and I do a bunch of empirical work to try and actually tease out the parameters of these structural models. I combine social sciences with engineering. This work that I showed you is more social sciences, but I can tell you that it was our understanding of technology that at some point allowed this company to run this experiment. I can tell you that one of the things that we did on the side was once you have different catalogs sent to the set-top boxes with different number of likes, and each set-top box is tuned into a different frequency for a different number of likes, we needed, before we started this experiment, to run a stress test. How would this scale with the company? Because the company didn't want to do this experiment and then in 24 hours the, the network would be done. So we actually did the scale, um, a scale test of how this, this, this could work. And so one way or another I'm working with big data analytics. Um, as of now from this company I have billions of observations per week because every time you click the remote control and there's 1.5 million households, you have a row in the file. I change channel. I turn on the TV and so on and so forth. Um, Applications to education policy. Um, this paper uh, that is forthcoming in management science looks at the effect of introducing ICTs in schools. And in a nutshell, what we found was that the grades of the students go down in <laughs> the two years after they get I internet in school. And the schools that block access to YouTube and Facebook perform relatively better. So we have some idea that uh, internet in schools is an opportunity for learning, but also for distraction. And the schools that engage more in distracting activities perform worse. So that's one finding that, that, that I wanted to share with you. I have a number of papers looking at the same, the same question at the university level. Uh, and I have another paper in which we show that the households close to the schools that use more internet increase their own uh, internet penetration even more. Uh, so there's this spillover effect in which the kids go to the schools, they like the internet uh, experience, they go home, and at least in the households that have kids in schools, close to schools that use more internet, the penetration of household internet increases disproportionately more. Uh, that's our hypothesis uh, about spillovers. I'm happy to discuss in more details how we get identification. Uh, finally, another, another paper that I have been working on is this peer influence in the diffusion of the iPhone. So what we are trying to do in this paper is to show that because your friends buy the iPhone, you're more likely to buy the iPhone. But the difficult question empirically is, um, is it really influence? Or is it because we all uh, looked at the same billboard on the street? or we all got calls from the sales representatives of the iPhone, so I can go in more detail about our identification strategy. But in this paper, we try to control for those things, and I can tell you that three out of 20 iPhones in this country were sold due to this peer influence effect. Okay. I have a bunch of other papers that look at how people influence others to change wireless provider. Um, and one of the things that, for me, it's more interesting that I'm working on right now is with this same cable company. They allow you to go back in time and watch anything that was uh, broadcasted for the past seven days. 
So imagine you subscribe to 80 channels of TV. You don't need to tape anything. It's there for you. Okay, so you can go back seven days and watch anything you want. First question, do you watch more or less TV when you can go back in time? I don't know, there might be substitutability effects, complementarity effects, and so this question of you can go back seven days in time and you can stream anything, how does it actually change consumption of, of TV? So that's, that's what I've been working on. This was just a little piece. Uh, I'm happy to discuss other, other questions, but I work at this, this interface of um, education and ICTs and media. I, I am extremely careful with the external validity of everything I do. I don't want to claim more than what is happening. I mean, for example, in this country, uh, when the internet was introduced in schools, the penetration of household internet was actually very low. So, okay, so it's not in the US. It's not in the US, yeah. okay? So it's not in the US, and so this doesn't apply to a place where there is already uh, uh, enough how, uh, enough internet in the households that you would only be looking at the marginal effect and I would actually think that perhaps in that case you wouldn't find anything because everybody already has internet in the household. So in this country is actually the start of the S-shaped curve and we can look at it and that might be the reason why we find a positive impact but that would certainly have implications for other developing countries that are at that level. Right? So. All right. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah.